Hi, my name is Alexander McGarry. I did the Grimshaw versus Ford Motor Company case. Um, basically, this is the case where the in a 1972 Ford Pinto hatchback stalled on the freeway, um, erupting into flames after it was rear-ended by own, by a different Ford. Um, Lily Gray and the driver the driver of the Pinto suffered severe burns to her entire body and resulted in the death by congestive heart failure. And a 13-year-old Richard Grimshaw suffered severe permanent disfigurations burns uh, to his entire body. Um, he underwent numerous skin grafts, uh, extended surgeries, and still lost portions of his fingers and left hand as well as his left ear in the accident. Um, doctors estimated that he would need another around 10 surgeries just to be out of the clear. Um, the experts testified that the Pinto gas tank was pushed forward upon impact and punctured by a bolt um, in the differential housing the fuel sprayed onto the tank and entered the passenger compartment through the gaps between the rear wells and the floor. Um, I'm kind of reading this a little bit like directly from the article just so that I don't mess any of it up. Um, the design of the fuel system, the courts found that Lee Ioka uh, at the same t at the time was the vice president of Ford, uh, conceived the Pinto project and with was in moving force. Uh, the project was basically to make a car that's under 2,000 pounds but could also be sold for no more than two thousand um, dollars. Basically, Ford knew that this issue could happen. Um, because of that, that's where like the negligence and all of the reasons why they got sued so much for it. Um, they knew that this was going to happen. They went through no, numerous crash tests with not only the Pinto but prototypes of the Pinto that could mimic almost exactly the same. Um, and they determined that the integrity of the fuel system in the rear end accidents um, propo proposed by the regular federal regulations um, was not fit for sale, um, but they moved ahead and did it anyways. Um, the truly horrible thing in this whole in this whole scenario is the fact is how small and insignificant the cost of would have been to fix the car. Um, it says that around seven to between five dollars and nine dollars back then um, would have been able to fix the car and make it so that the this type of issue wouldn't have happened and then upwards of, of around twelve to fourteen dollars would have been able to completely remove not only that issue but it also could have changed the way that say a 50 mile an hour uh, rear crash would have actually not have, uh, gone through this same thing uh, that would have been basically putting the gas tank in a different in a separate gas tank so basically it wouldn't be able to puncture the gas tank it would just puncture the pre the first gas tank um the court system the jury awarded 127.8 million dollars um to lily as well as um richard grimshaw uh this was later changed to i think 3.5 million dollars by the judge but at the time that was still th like five times the amount ever given in punitive damages um the Court of Appeals, um, basically they, Ford tried to say that the, uh, the court judgment was based on errors and contested the, pun the punitive damages awarded on the grounds of absence of malice, and the punitive damages award was not authorized by statute and was unconstitutional. Um, saying, basically the, saying that they didn't have malice for the damages, um, of, there wasn't specific malice, but at the same time, Malice requires evil motive uh, or an intent to earn, injure the person harmed for punitive damages and argued absence of malice. Sorry, I'm backtracking a little bit. The appellate court cited proceed precedent the malice is used in California exemplary damages. Code included not only a malicious intent to injure the specific person harmed, but conduct ev evincing a conscious disregard for the probability of the actor's conduct or result in injury to others. Um, they cited Taylor versus Superior Court. The California Superior Court held that a conscious disregard of the safety of others insufficient to meeting uh, amius malaris required for primitive punitive damages awarded, adding, in order to justify it and award a punitive damages on this basis, the plaintiffs must establish that the defendant was aware of the probable dan dangerous consequences of his conduct and he willfully, deliberately, failed to avoid those consequences. In commercial context, uh, the imposition of punitive damages deters the furtherance of objectionable corporate policies and encourages the remedy of safe concerns that might 
otherwise go unchecked. Um, I wanted to read that a little bit more exactly the way that it was written, just so that it comes off correct. Um, I didn't want to, you know, paraphrase any of that. Um, there was ev the evidence to support the finding of malice in Ford was the fact that the management knew that this could happen. The vice president knew that this could happen, but they also continued to make it. Um, they decided that the cost benefit was to decide to defer from the corrections as um, compared to the human lives and limbs in according to profit. Um, there's substantial evidence that uh, Ford conducted cons constituted con conscious disregard of the probability of injuries to members of the consuming public. Um, <clears throat> Ford argued that the amount awarded in the punitive damage was excessive, but basically what they, what the judge did, um, they used the net worth of the company. Um, at the time, in light of Ford's $7.7 .7 billion net worth and $9,938 million income after tax in 1976, uh, the court found that punitive damage was about 0.005% of Ford's net worth and 0.3% of its income, basically saying that the damages compared to their net worth was, uh, was awardable. Um, so the reason that I chose this specific case um, one, I didn't know a ton about it. Um, I knew that it was one of the, I knew it was one of the more notorious cases. Um, af obviously, after reading all of this about the case, I didn't realize how horrible the case was at the time. Um, I'm actually glad that you suggested this case more than other ones. Um, I think this case was perfect for our class, considering the fact that our class kind of dealt with the fact that management should focus on the fact that they do have a legal a legal census behind them they are the beginning and like they are the company and anything that management does upper lower middle any type of management can actually truly damage the company as obviously we can see in this the case um, if Ford would have taken the action if the management and upper management would have said we need to not just cut corners we need to make sure that this doesn't happen they would not have been sued um, because of this they opened themselves up to no numerous other lawsuits about this exact same thing i think there's they set up to a hundred different claims about this as well obviously not awarding the same amount um but this case is notorious in uh law just because it's one of the bigger one of the biggest uh damage damages awarded other than the where is it hardy versus general motors in 19 1996. Um, basically, $127.8 million in damages was awarded. Uh, I know the judge reduced the punitive damages award to $3.5 million. Um, he later said larger than any other punitive damages in the state by a factor of about five. I know I already said that, but I just wanted to reiterate it. <coughs> I thought this court, this was a perfect case for this course just because we've spent basically the entire course talking about how we have a moral right to not only treat employees correctly, but make sure that we're defending our employees, our customers, and basically Ford decided that that didn't matter and that money and the driving profit and the small increment of cost that it would take to fix this issue was worth way more than the lives of these two humans and anyone else that got hurt through this. Um, obviously, it's a really bad case. Um, I think personally that the Ford Motor Company really just shot themselves in the foot with it, um, especially now that, especially since there's obviously they went through and I mean I have I have actual the exact breakdown um, because I thought it was interesting. Longitudinal side members for the car would be two dollars and forty cents each. Uh, cross members would be a dollar and eighty cents each. Sock absorbing flank suits for the fuel tank four dollars. Um, Nylon bladder within the tank, $5.25. Uh, placement of the tank over the rear axle as a protective barrier, $9.95. I know I'm getting close to the 10 minute mark, so I don't want to go too much more. But basically, for a total of $15, they would have been able to completely change the way that the, the fuel tanks was safe in the 35 to 38 mile per hour range. To get to the 50, they would have had to spend 19. So basically, they decided that $19 wasn't worth the safety of their customers. Um, I really appreciate. I really enjoyed this reading about this, learning about this. Um, it kind of opened up my eyes to like how companies disregard human life um, and other people and just common sense um, and the fact that negligence truly is a big part of business. Um, 
I hope this was I hope that you enjoyed this and I hope that this gets downloaded properly. Thank you for your time. My name is Alexander McGarry again and this was my report.